This is a Lada Neva, or as it was known in the former Soviet Union, the... that... whatever that is. Uh, it's mine. I bought it. It's a 1982 model. Not that it matters because they're still being made today and they still look exactly the same. But I'm going to take you for a drive, show you the car and its quirks, and also show you what I plan to do with it in the near future. But first, here's some history on this car. Back in 1971, car makers in the Soviet Union were told to make a car which was suitable for families and farmers in rural areas. Designers and engineers spent four years creating and testing the Lada Neva in the dry deserts of Kazakhstan and the brutal winters of Siberia, fine-tuning and upgrading gearboxes and engines over five years until it was finally approved for production in 1976. Since then, it's barely changed at all, and you can still buy them brand new today, albeit with more modern looking bumpers and a more modern interior, but underneath the shell it's the same car it was 45 years ago, which makes it the longest running four wheel drive vehicle still in production in its original form. When the first model started leaving factories in 1978, they became a hit, quickly capturing 40% of the European 4x4 market. And despite the Cold War heating up, this car soon became Lada's best-selling export. And the waiting lists were long, especially for Soviet citizens, because exports were quickly given priority, despite the fact it was supposed to be a car for locals. And while the United States avoided Soviet goods like the plague, Europe, South America, Australia, Japan, and even my country, New Zealand, imported these cars. And for that strange story, we have to go back in time to New Zealand in the 1980s. Believe it or not, back in the 1980s, New Zealand and the Soviet Union formed a small, short-lived, odd trading partnership whereby New Zealand would send meat, dairy products and fertilizer to the Soviet Union, and in return, Russia would send us tractors, vodka and, yes, Lada vehicles. The result is that quite a few Ladas flooded New Zealand's roads and my dad ended up buying a brand new Lada Neva 4x4 for fun, off-roading and hitting the beach in summer. And it left such a positive impression that in the late 1990s, I went out and bought this one myself in lime green. And thus an automotive love affair was born. So when I moved to the USA and I saw this rare example for sale in Seattle, I jumped on a plane and bought it, then spent 12 long days and 3,000 miles driving it, mostly in the slow lane, all the way from Washington State down here to my home in Florida. The car had a few hiccups along the way, leaked a lot of fuel, and it died occasionally, but ultimately it got me home in one piece. I also made a video of this trip, if you're interested, just click on the profile to watch it. But enough history, let me show you the car. The car's exterior is pretty functional. It was designed to have good ground clearance, enough to allow it to wade through 50 centimeters of water comfortably without any issue. A couple of interesting points on the exterior of the car are the tires. Now these are the original Russian spec tires, which are pretty thin, as you can see. They're thin off-roading tires. And if you can find these for sale in the United States, I will start a new religion in your name, because these 175, 80, 16 Cs, I've tried to find them, and the tire shops just say, whoa, no, no chance. Another interesting thing about the exterior of the car is possibly my favorite thing of all, these adorable little headlight wipers, which obviously allow you to go off-roading at night, or more practically, if you're in Siberia and it's snowing, these little things will wipe away the snow. Or what's even worse than the actual snow is what happens after it snows and the snow starts melting on the road and you get all that brown muck. Well, these things keep their headlights nice and clear. One other interesting thing is this hole, which links through this hole in the front bumper. And it's designed so that you can crank start the car with an actual handle if your battery's flat in the middle of the Siberian winter. This car didn't come with a crank handle, unfortunately, but my workmate is having one made up. So in the next video, it'll be me live action caught on video breaking my own wrist. So stay tuned for that one. Okay, one more thing I want to point out. You've obviously noticed the license plate on the front of the car. It's a cheeky word. It's a Russian meme, uh, bliat, which is obviously a bad word. Um, Google it, kids. I'm not going to say what word it is, because then Google will say, ooh, that's not appropriate for kids. Uh, but that license plate, I didn't realize what that number meant. When I had this custom plate made, I chose 82 because, one, I didn't know what it meant, and two, the car is from 1982, so I chose 82. I didn't realize that it's a region number. And 82, according to the comments on YouTube, 
is Crimea. Uh, I try and stay out of politics, especially geopolitics. So I really screwed up. <laughs> because obviously Crimea, big point of contention, big debate between Russia and Ukraine. And I stay well over. I apologize to anyone whom I've offended by this license plate. <laughs> Not the word, the number. That was, yeah, I screwed up. <laughs> anyway, let me show you what's under the hood. The first thing you'll notice about the car is the spare tire is under the hood. Now this is a fairly low mileage example. It's done about 38,000 kilometers, uh, which means that it's, it's in pretty good nick. The tire itself, obviously, this tire's never been used. Uh, the interesting things about the engine bay continue, because we've got the original hand pump for the tires, which could be handy. This is a 12 volt outlet that allows you to have a lamp, a magnetized lamp you can hang on the, the hood for when you're inevitably going to be fixing the engine because it is, the, the nicest thing I can say about it is it's an Italian designed engine improved upon by the Soviets. So you can imagine the level of quality. It's just, it smells of imminent failure. It's going to fail, we just don't know when. On the other side, you can see the original tire jack, which I hope I never have to use. All of the electrics, like the coil here, you can see everything is in Cyrillic, Russian text. Same with the warning stickers, the label. It's all very original. It is straight off the boat, so to speak. Now the engine is, as I said, the engine is Italian designed, uh, taken from a Fiat. The body and the front suspension, however, uh, and the four-wheel drive system are all designed in-house and tested over five years by the Soviets. And it's been proven pretty effective. The engine, eh, can't say much good about that, but the rest of the body is, and the mechanics are pretty unbeatable. These things, uh, these, these, these things are mountain goats. They will just climb anything. As for the interior, it is basic. It has rubber mats, no carpeting, Black plastic interior, black vinyl for the seats, which cooks your ass in the summer. The heater only has two speeds, mild noise and slightly louder noise. No rear demister and obviously no air conditioning. And all the gauges are in Russian. However, you may have noticed it has three gear levers, which allows this car to operate a bit like a mountain goat once it's off the road. Obviously, this is your gear lever, which goes through gears one, two, three, four and reverse. But down here we have the high and low ratio, which allows you to use maximum uh, torque and power when climbing hills and stuff like that. And this is the differential lock. It locks all the wheels, so if you've got one hanging off the edge of a cliff or something, instead of that just spinning endlessly, it will lock all of them to work together at the same speed. Great for getting yourself out of muddy holes. The story behind this car is kind of interesting too. As I said, it's only done 38,000 kilometers, which is pretty low. Uh, it's only had one owner in Ukraine. The car, from what the previous owner told me, this one was built in Soviet Russia and given as a gift to a Ukrainian official. He used to apparently work for the government, uh, because, but he didn't use it because he already had a driver assigned to him. So this car basically sat in his garage, getting a bit banged up by bikes and stuff like that, uh, and his son didn't want it because there was a long period of time where these things were desperately uncool. Uh, so he didn't want the thing, so it just sat there neglected. When the guy who brought it to the USA, a Russian guy who lives in Seattle, it still had the plastic covering the back seat. So it was just ignored. It was barely used. And it means that it's a treasure trove of stuff like this. These are all the documents that came with the car. Service information, random stuff let's have a closer look so this is the part where i could probably use your help actually because i don't know what some of this stuff is like these cards with the dates on them i'm guessing they're service cards i don't know what they say it's all in russian i have no idea fascinating stuff though other documents that came with the car mystery stuff like that i mean heck what does that say I have no idea. <laughs> and then there's this, oh wow, that's actually printed out on, on, on a printer. 
Oh, probably a dot matrix, that's awesome. But still, no idea what it says. It goes on and on and on. There's all this sort of stuff like, like this. I would love it if, uh, if this could be translated by someone because I really want to know the history behind this car, you know? Like this random... You know, the secrets to Atlantis. Okay, recognize that word. K-A-R-T-A. Carta. Card. Okay, cool. Yes, I speak Russian now. Okay. So that's kind of interesting. All the service information that came with the car. It was all tucked up in the sun visor for the last 39 years. But I want to show you something else that's even more interesting. This. Okay, we start with this rubber thing, which is either to stop bleeding or for adult entertainment. If you've seen the video of me driving across the country, at the first stop at the gas station, I ran into a Ukrainian guy who knew what the car was, and he briefly translated this document. Okay, so this was in the uh, the first aid kit, and you're from Ukraine. So what does it what yes. does it say? Okay, it's said about the factory when it death was produced. Uh huh. And this is the serial number of this one. This first aid this kit. This is yes? the serial number. This is the price, and it was made in Odessa, Ukraine. But as for the rest of the stuff, I do not know. I mean, this obviously this is bandages. None of this stuff's been used, which is remarkable. More bandages. I can figure that part out. You know, that's pretty self-explanatory. Micro enema. And this is where things start to get a little bit into the unknown, because I don't know what this stuff is. Okay. Oh, boric acid. Okay, 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 okay. I can figure that out. Yes. All right. I'm a spy. <laughs> Secret agent. Espionage for the win. Okay. I don't know what this document is. Nope, not a clue. And this is where things get even weirder. Like, what is that? Probably best not to drink it, but there's no Latin script or English script on there at all. It's all Cyrillic. It's Russian, so no idea. Ooh. Just getting these uh, Chernobyl flashbacks. Actually, I went to Chernobyl a few years ago. It was awesome. Had a great time. Bloody cold. Yeah, but don't know what that stuff is. Another vial. Don't know what that is, but it could be charcoal, maybe. Or is it iron filings? Why would you have iron filings? I don't know. I don't know what that is. Someone on the internet, tell me what is it. And last but not least, this is the weirdest one. I thought it was a box of matches. You know? It's not. It is a little glass of vials, and all of them intact. This has never been used. What is it? Can someone tell me what it is, please? What do I do with it? Where do I stick it? Fascinating stuff. But there's even more fascinating stuff in this car. I want to show you something else. Believe it or not, this car has the original toolkit from Soviet Russia. You want to take a look inside. This thing is pretty out there. So it's got the usual stuff, you know. Spanners sockets you know I don't know if you can make it out but it says made in USSR you just don't get that anymore for obvious reasons little wrench everything you could possibly need to fix your larder on the side of the road even a little tire pressure gauge but wait there's more on the other side we've got more toys a complete spanner set I don't know if these are from the Soviet Union or not. I mean, that is. Check that out. That's pretty out there. But enough about tools and medical stuff and documents and interiors. Let's take this car for a drive. Driving this thing could best be described as agricultural. It is basic, but it does have a low center of gravity, so it's not unbearable. But as you can hear, there's a lot of cabin noise, even doing 20 kilometers an hour. So you can imagine how loud it is once you get on the highway. That being said, it is a lot of fun to drive, you know? I just get so many looks in this car. Like, 
it's this car cost me ten thousand six hundred dollars but you'd think i'd spent a hundred grand on it because the amount of attention it gets dude i love your lot of neva <laughs> fucking amazing 82 <laughs> <laughs> what on earth is that? It's uh, from Russia, it's called a Lada. <laughs> Lada from Russia. Is that a Russian car? It is. <laughs> it's a uh, Lada from the Soviet Union. I love that. <laughs> it's different. <laughs> it's great that Americans love cars just as much as I do. My only concern was the fake license plate on the front with the rude Russian word. I was scared that if someone actually understood it, they might be quite offended. However, my fears were put to rest when a young Russian couple actually saw the car while it was parked at the pub, and this is their reaction. Honestly, this thing turns more heads than a Maserati, so we took it up the beach for a day's swimming, and that's when I finally got to use the off-road capabilities, and it just felt so at home. It rode softer, it felt grippy, it had no qualms at all with the sand, even the really soft stuff. It just felt like it was meant to be there. Car feels like it's at home. This is wicked. I love it. I was so inspired by the positive response of the car that I decided to do something I've never done before and actually take it to a car meet. So I got busy washing it, scrubbing it, polishing it, wiping it, drying it and making sure it was in tip top condition to be put on display for the world to see. And with the car looking as polished and shiny and clean as it did when it rolled off that Soviet production line, I got busy driving down to the car meet to see what the reaction would be from actual car fans and whether or not it would turn as many heads as I thought it might. Sake. So yeah, that happened. The damage was moderate. The other driver admitted fault for the accident and this was put down on the police report. I filed a claim with my insurance company and they began chasing that up so I could get money and go to a panel beater to get an estimate for the repairs. But if you've had someone carelessly drive into your car, especially when you've just washed and polished it and taking it to a car show, you know it hits you hard. No pun intended, but it really dragged my mood down and it put me in a funk for many weeks. But a few days later, the insurance had approved a preliminary payout for repairs, so I took it down to my local repair shop and they did an estimate on what's going to be needed to bring this car back to life. Because these cars are still being made new today, we figured it would be cheaper and simpler just to order a brand new door straight from Ukraine to put on the car, have it painted and I'll drive away. So I pressed the buy now button and waited a month for it to finally arrive and when it did, my mood began to finally improve. Yeah, so the car door's arrived. Uh, on my way to pick it up from the in-laws and then I'm going to drop it off at the auto body repair shop. And I'm also kind of curious to see what progress has been done in the month it's taken. <laughs> my bloody knob's in the way. And the month has taken since I dropped it off. So, watch this space. I'm excited. Haven't seen my car for ages. I'm keen to see how it looks. Believe it or not, the mail truck delivers it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So I took the car down to the auto body repair shop so we could unwrap it and see what needed to be done to get this car back on the road. Well, that's brand new. Brand new. Unfortunately, more bad news was coming. Here, you just hold that up, pull it up. Uh, a little bumpy in the bottom. Oh, oh shit, there is oh, two. Both sides, yeah. Oh, Christ. Oh gosh, that's pretty bad. Oh, up here. <laughs> that's pretty bad. Oh well. So, you should call yeah. them. Oh here. my gosh, this thing's all beat up. Here, here, here. The shipping company, nobody signed for it. So they can't hold them responsible. The door was screwed. 
It looked like it had been dropped several times during shipping and it was going to be a lot of money to repair it. Well, unfortunately, the progress hasn't begun yet because obviously they didn't get the door. And you've seen the door. It is pretty munted. Really kind of annoyed about that. So, yeah. Yeah. I told the panel beater to start fixing that door even though it was going to come out of my own pocket. And a week later I went over to see the progress, but there was some bad news. That's progress. Yeah, we got a problem with that door. Some of this is completely in inaccurate. The, the, um, where the mirror mounts, yeah. uh, the holes are ba spaced like this. Right. And of course, yeah, this, this, this hole so this is... would have to be refabricated and welded for this stud to be over here or the or the thread to be over here so it's a big it's a big test and for the fit look at the fit here that's totally off bloody hell it almost looks like, like somebody pounded the door to try to make it to where it's gonna look like it would fit better aye, aye, aye. maybe they did that instead of happening in shipping <laughs> <laughs> see this is the rocker that's how it's supposed to look right you know what I mean that's how it's supposed to look. Okay, so right what off do we got? Bat, where the stop goes is different. It's the one on that door is recessed in. Um, oh, the stop too. Yeah, the stop is different. This bolt is not here. This hole where this handle goes is not there. Where this goes is not there. This the is not even on the other one. So this would have to be one. taken off and re-welded to the new door. And the whole bottom of you don't the want door. To that. And the whole bottom of the door, instead of curving like this, it goes down and goes I like saw this that. and sticks out too. Oh, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I showed you. yeah, everything is oh, these screw holes here for the wing window, they're not in it. It it's I just can't believe they didn't tell you that before different. you ordered it. You know what I mean? So we were back to square one. Do I spend even more money getting that door fabricated to fit the car properly, or do we just go back and fix the original door? Unfortunately, I broke my phone in the meantime, I broke my sports cameras, I broke my phone's new screen again, and even my potatoes had died, so it looked like everything in my life was going wrong at that moment. But before long, I got some text messages from the auto body repair shop saying that finally the car was in the painting booth ready to be fixed up. And after nine agonizing weeks since the crash, I got the green light to come and pick up my car. Wifey's dropping me off. I'm gonna pick up my car. Guess what, they painted it red. They did it, they did not have painted it red. There it is, there it is, there it is. Holy cow, look at that. Check that out. Look at that. I mean, bloody hell. That is flawless. Absolutely flawless. Look at it. Man. Just, it's better than when it left the factory in Soviet Russia, man. I am so bloody thrilled. Oh, man. I've earned myself a beer. You have no idea how happy I was to get my wheels back, so I had to jump behind the wheel and take it for a drive. Oh, yes. Oh, baby. Oh, man. I'm so happy I could cry right now. It's been so long. It's been... Oh man, it's been uh, what, a, what an ordeal, eh? Hey? What an ordeal. I drove all the way to the pub with a stupid grin on my face, and before long, people were asking me about the car as per normal. What is it? <laughs> it's a Lada from Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought it in Seattle last year and I drove it across the country. What, uh, what year is it? 82. But they still make them today, they look exactly the same. You're a brave man. <laughs> <laughs> I soon pulled into the pub for what is possibly the most well-earned beer in history. Oh, here comes the beer, here comes the beer. 
you I've earned this. Thank you so much. You got a big scar on your face on this film. But anyway, back to driving the car. I would say my only real criticism of this vehicle is that it's utterly gutless. I mean, really slow. See, I have to floor it to try and keep up with old ladies in Cadillacs. And they're still getting away from me. It's bloody embarrassing. Did I mention the noise? <laughs> what a racket. Now this is the part where people are going to start downvoting the video. Because remember earlier on I was talking about my plans for this car. Well, my big plan is to convert this thing to run on batteries. Yep, I'm going to make it electric. Now I know immediately there's going to be people leaping out of the comments saying, Oh, you're ruining the originality of your car. <clears throat> my car. It's mine. I can do whatever the hell I want with it. And yet these soapy titwanks that say, Oh, you're not allowed to do what I say with your car. Do they run out there and buy one? Uh, to store in a garage? To preserve the legacy? No, they don't do that. These hypocrites just sit on the internet and tell me what I should and shouldn't do with my own bloody car. Having said that, I have had a few cars in the past. I've had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 21, 22, 23, 24, uh, 25 cars in my life. So there is a reasonable expectation that I may not have this car forever as well. So when I convert this to run on batteries, I've not lost my mind. I am gonna keep all the parts in storage, all the gas burning parts, exhaust pipes, fuel lines, engine, anything I'm gonna keep because one day if I do sell it, I will revert it back to run on gas. And that means that I'm probably going to be doing something that I don't think anyone's done before, which is convert a car to electricity with the expectation of reverting it back to gas. That means the, uh, the conversion to electric is going to be as minimalist as possible, as few holes drilled as possible, as little damage to the body as possible, and I don't think anyone's done that before. So hopefully that will keep the internet whinges a little bit happy, and so they'll stop telling me what I should do with my own car, which is... I mean, what a bunch of dick blossoms. Who says that to another person? Crikey. As for electric motor and batteries, I'm still undecided. I think I will probably use either a Nissan Leaf motor or a Toyota Hybrid motor uh, and reprogram those to run on the car. That is all up in the air. Um, I don't know whether I'm keeping the gearbox or not yet. Battery pack size and range, I don't know. This car's only used for going to the supermarket in the weekends and going up the beach and having a bit of fun, you know, going to car shows and stuff. Uh, so I'll probably start with a small pack, but hey, who's to say I don't just chuck a couple of Tesla battery packs, you know, when I win the lottery, obviously, on a trailer and have a thousand miles of range, you know? Well, you know, within reason. Uh, so nothing's decided yet. Uh, as for the awkward situation about money, I st I'm still saving. My budget is about $7,000 uh, for the conversion. I've got about half that now. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, I, I'm far too proud to accept money, so a friend of mine without me knowing set up a GoFundMe in my name. Uh, I will reluctantly put a link in the description, but do not feel pressured to donate anything. I'd, I'd prefer it if you didn't actually, because it, it just it just feels weird. Uh, I'll, I'll do it on my own. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just weird. Uh, so, uh, watch this space. It's going to take a little while. I don't have a garage. Sitting here right now in the Florida heat, I am literally dripping with sweat. Uh, so <laughs> it's going to be an adventure. So stay tuned for the next video when I'm hopefully going to start buying components. I have enough already to buy a motor. So now that the car's fixed and back from the panel beater, I can measure the engine bay and see what I'm in for. Stick around to the next video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it should be a great adventure. Take it easy. Bye.